Yeehaw. <laughs> <laughs> hey, girls. Hello. Hello. How are you feeling today? Wonderful. Yeah? I have jet Forgo lagged, but alive. Slushy? Slushy. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot my hat, so oh, I'll, no. have to, I'll have to compensate with this crazy dress. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm excited to be chatting about the future of creativity online. So maybe we just start with some introductions. Um, Pipa, do you want to just tell us who you are? And maybe as a little prompt, we could all share what creativity means to us personally. Sure. And thanks, everyone, for being here. So my day job is I'm a partner at Sweet Capital. And I think it's probably helpful if I give a bit of context as to why I'm so excited about the future of creativity. So I grew up as a crazy design nerd. I was that kid using Corel Draw 3.0 to design vector graphic stickers to sell to my friends. I was using all the Adobe products um, to design overly complex PSD files for homework projects. And when I was at Oxford, I felt like I was the only kid that really cared about being an illustrator and, and a graphic designer. I used to run like workshops for, for how to use InDesign and, and Illustrator and, and Photoshop. So my DNA is also in gaming consumer. So I've long before the proverbial metaverse became a thing, I was looking at virtual worlds and sort of the roles of digital fashion and what identity means. And I think it, you know, if we be a bit cheesy, I've gone from paintbrushes and pencils all the way th through to pixels and now machine, like large um, language models, which doesn't really fit into the alliteration. But at every sort of evolution, I've been so inspired by the role that technology has played in augmenting human creativity and uh, really excited to get into some of that today. Yeah, perfect. Cyan? Hi, I'm Cyan Bannister. I'm a venture capitalist with Long Journey Ventures, which is a firm that uh, I started with my partners. Uh, prior to that, I was at Founders Fund for four years. I'm also an entrepreneur, and um, I've invested in over a couple hundred different companies. And I don't like talking about myself, so I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> what does creativity mean to you personally? What does creativity mean to me? Well, I think, you know, I think if you have an idea and you bring it into reality, so, you know, how do you do that? How do you take a disparate concept and make it real? And so that's how I would define it, I think. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's um, the ability to take an idea from the imagination and apply some sort of magic paintbrush, which I think, amazingly, through things like AI now, anyone with an imagination has the ability to be a conceptual artist. Um, and it can be whatever you want it to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll just quickly introduce myself as well. So my name is Ida Josefina. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sane. Um, we're building um, an integrated web for ideas, and we'll touch on topics related to, I think, a lot of our mutual interests today. But creativity, to me, I think, means this constant sort of synergy or tango between like a two-sided coin. One side is sort of this, I don't know, what you consider as sort of a, the output, all of the you know, inner experiences that you're able to package into something and put it out into the world. And then the other side is like everything that you're taking in. And it's sort of the synergy or tango between the two. Um, so I wanted to take a few moments, just to introduce the topic that uh, we'll be chatting about in more depth and sort of where this came from as we started workshopping it with Cyan and, and Pipa. Um, I think for me, some one of the things that I'm the most excited about in the world is trying to think about what we can do to sort of mitigate some of the biggest risks that we're facing in the world. And obviously, there's so many of them across the board from you know, climate change to AGI and nuclear weapons and bioweapons. And I've always thought of it as sort of you know, collective wisdom being sort of this umbrella idea on top of all of these other problems and risks that we're facing. And that's something that we really need in order to be able to solve all of the individual uh, problems and th threats underneath it. And when I've been thinking about collective wisdom or collective intelligence over the years, it's just really dawned on me that we can't just keep squeezing out of existing resources, which I think has been, the tech industry has been so dominated by a lot of tools for further increasing productivity or building out new innovations that further drive productivity in different ways. But we've largely, 
in some ways ignored um, the other side of it, which I think is creativity. So if we think about productivity being about uh, squeezing everything out of existing resources, and then creativity would be about creating new resources. And that's why I think it's so important, not just for ourselves on a personal, sort of intellectual, spiritual, human level, but also in terms of unlocking new innovation and building a better society. So uh, that's kind of maybe like the the idea behind wanting to put the center stage and have a real conversation and see uh, what creativity can look like from building to investing and to operating and what its place might be in the tech industry. So, yeah, uh, starting with questions. Um, maybe for Cyan first, um, what do you think art and creativity actually have to do with technology? We can just start from the very beginning. Could you ask that again? I'm, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, what do you think art and technology have to do, or sorry, art and creativity have to do with technology? Oh, gosh. Well, I think of technology as art and creativity. If you think about code um, and you think about creation in itself, like all of these products, every entrepreneur that starts out to create something starts with a blank canvas, the idea, and then they have to turn it into something. And, and a lot of times we don't even think about all of that is creative expression, but it absolutely is. And so I think that, you know, every single bit of technology and software, maybe it's a little bit broad for me to say that, is a form of art. And um, pretty much everything, really, if you look at it through that lens, is a form of art. And so I, I tend to, when, I, when I'm investing, uh, look through that lens. And so I, I, that's how I think about it. Yeah, and when we first met, you actually asked me a question that I've never stopped thinking about. Not that I'm obsessed with Kinder Eggs or anything, but you, <laughs> <laughs> you asked am. me to tell you a story of the first time that I ate a Kinder Surprise Egg. Yeah. And I wanted to actually see if you wanted to share that story because I thought yeah. it was a good prompt. So if you think about a lot of products that are out there, like if you look at blog platforms, um, X, Facebook, etc., they give you a blank box and they ask you a question and you're supposed to go fill it out. But what they don't do is try to prompt you along the way to try to get out valuable information that we as human beings have that we're losing every single day, which is our memories. And so one of the things that I asked her was, do you remember the first time you ever had a Kinder Surprise egg? The reason why I used Kinder was because you're from Europe. But if, you know, if you're in America, I might say a Snicker bar. And What's interesting is that people suddenly stop and they're like, oh, yeah, I remember my first Kinder Surprise Egg. My first Kinder Surprise Egg was in Hong Kong. And um, I was in my early 20s uh, working at a startup. And I remember finding it and opening it up and being so delighted with the toy inside and like, wow, this thing exists. And of course, we couldn't get those in America at the time where they were illegal or something like that. <laughs> um, but if you ask people, like, what's your... If I said, you know, do you like McDonald's? Most people in here would be like, no, I don't like McDonald's. McDonald's is nasty, it's gross. But if I said, what's your favorite memory of McDonald's? That's gonna be a very, very different answer. And so I would love to see more startups and more companies starting to think about how to extract and get this type of information from people because we're losing it every day. Yeah. And so it, it's just really sad to me. And that's one of the reasons why I asked you. It's just like how could you share this memory with me? And, and what startup is ever going to ask you that question? Because yeah. they haven't yet. Or also, I think a lot of us think that we are not you know, interesting or that we don't have something to say and something to share in many instances. And I really believe that everyone has something to say and something to share. And it's really interesting to think that from the perspective of um, building and investing into companies is like, how can we actually use technology as a means to make people feel like they have something to say and something to share? Um, and maybe on that note, people actually, identity building. I'm curious about how you think about identity build, how identity building will develop online if we're thinking about unlocking these sort of unprecedented amounts of human creativity. I love these questions, by the way. <laughs> so I think, I mean, building on from, you know, what Sian just said, I love this idea of the proverbial kinder egg surprise. You know, you open it and then you find this little toy. And I think one of the things I'm most excited about at the moment is this sort of taking a sledgehammer to these traditional constraints that creativity have been sort of placed within. And I always think of that meme that I don't know if any of you guys have seen where it was like, okay, 
it's four pictures and it's like, here's me on Twitter, here's me on Instagram, here's me on like LinkedIn, and here's me on like GitHub. And it's basically four completely different identities that is you as a human squeezed into one of these sort of four structured profiles of your like identity. And it's always kind of bothered me that you would need to have four different, you know, tubes you're being, you know, squeezed down. And I think that we're actually in this new era where I'm hopeful that we can, again, take this sledgehammer to that and say, well, why can't we all have a blank canvas to create our own, you know, original Internet 1.0 homepage? You know, why can't we all have a blank canvas to project what it is, what it means to be us? And I think, you know, I've, I've been playing on a few tools recently. Um, there's one which is a sort of social whiteboarding app called Ammo, and most people are using this to post pictures of themselves. And I think within the first 24 hours, I'd used it to install a gaming center where you could like find out clues about me. There was like an e-commerce part where you could buy random innocuous things that I thought were a part of my identity. Um, and then there were things like you know a DJ booth where I could put my favorite music. So. All of a sudden, instead of having, you know, go to my LinkedIn, go to my Twitter, you can basically have a blank canvas, which is my identity um, as me, and it can be dynamic, it can evolve, and, and other people can comment on that. So I think with this new era of creative tools, and again, this idea that with some tools like AI, anyone with an imagination can now be a conceptual artist much more easily. You've got these really sort of user-friendly tools that we can all actually enter to this much more unbridled creative um, future that before forced us to kind of be th these sausages <laughs> made by the different tech sausages. platforms. I did say sausages. <laughs> the sausage like a sausage. <laughs> Colorful sausage. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I wonder if, because if we all have the tools to be able to do from a technical and like a skill practical perspective of what we would like to do, if that actually kind of forces us to think more about the fundamentals of you know, what we want to do and who we are if we can't use the excuse of that thing is hard to use or we need you know, a lot of skill to be able to get to that level of even trying whether we're good at it. If all of that is removed, we kind of are, I guess, you know, made to force ourselves and our ideas in a much more aggressive way than if the barrier of getting there would be much higher. Um, there is a statement, there's this, um, there's this book um, by Joel Lehman and Kenneth Stanley, I hope I didn't mess up the names, called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. Have you guys read it? No. Okay. Um, it's really good. It talks a lot about objectives versus serendipity, which I think ties into like sort of productivity versus creativity also really well. And um, I think in that book, there was a statement that I highlighted and I really loved that said, uh, the, in a, the best innovators do their best innovations just by being themselves. What do you guys think about that? Oh, for sure. I mean. You're going to be your best at life if you figure out who you really, truly are, period, the end, and you are just yourself as much as you possibly can be. I know that's a bit of a luxury, um, but it should be the thing that people strive for in life. That's what I think, anyway. <laughs> no, I, I, 100%. Look, I think if we can all try and be as authentic as possible, that's, that's amazing, and that, for me, is when I've seen you know, the most creative ideas come to life, whether it be a founder that I'm investing in or whether it's an artist that I'm going to, to visit a gallery. So yeah, no, totally agree. Align your chakras to build the best products. <laughs> to what extent do you think that founders should take this seriously and sort of be aligned with the universe in order to do their best work? Is that something worth even thinking about or considering on sort of more of an active basis? If you'd asked me that question a couple of years ago, I would have thought, I would have said, what are you talking about? <laughs> Chakras? What? Um, but about a year and a half ago, I had an experience uh, that changed my life, and I became a much more spiritual person. And I believe now, absolutely, yes, uh, you should have an open mind to it, and I think that you... Now I'm willing to try everything. I'm just like, I went from like, absolutely no, there's nothing in the universe other than what exists right in front of us. There is no grand plan. There is no anything to completely succumbing and submitting to the universe. And now I build it as part of my investment practice um, and as what I do from, a, from day to day. So absolutely, I do think that 
you know, not just chakra stuff, but just sort of mental health and well-being and your own identity and your own wellness is incredibly important, especially if you're an entrepreneur. Uh, I had a panel earlier where we were talking about how, you know, if you're going to be working 12-hour days, seven days a week, things like that, like you really do need to take care of who your core is, who you really, really, truly are. And if it's, you know, meditation, if it's chakra alignment, if it's saunaing, if it's whatever it takes, you know, do it. <laughs> uh, because otherwise, you're not going to survive the journey. Uh, so you, you definitely should do it, and I recommend it for everybody. What do you do? I meditate. So I meditate an unreasonable amount, probably, by most people's standards. So usually two to three hours a day. And wow. that might be shocking, but that's my nighttime routine. And then afterwards, I journal all of the revelations that come from that meditation. And then I do a, a small meditation in the morning before I start my day. What about you, Pippa? I also love meditating, and I'm a big fan of journaling. I think it's born out of my obsession always with... I, I love writing. Um, I always grew up doing a lot of writing as well, and I think I've, I've actually really transformed that as well into a place where in my creative process, whether I'm sitting down and I'm going to uh, write a short piece of fiction or if I want to you know, do some portraiture or, or painting, I'm, a, I'm still a big artist in my spare time, then I actually try and just grab a piece of, of paper and start kind of writing out thoughts. And I find that's also a very meditative experience when it comes to, to work as well uh, and really trying to think at the core of of, you know, again, say, for example, in our work as venture capitalists, you know, what is the true essence of this problem that, that needs to be solved, and am I really inspired by it? Um, and, yeah, I do other sort of wellness things as well. How many artist VCs do you think there are? <laughs> uh, I think there's not so many of us. I don't think there's many of us. Can we list names? And I, obviously, yeah. and I forgot my hat, my cowboy hat today, so sorry, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if we just go back to the sort of future of work question. Uh, Pippa, what do you think? Creativity over productivity. What, what do you think that looks like in terms of what kind of companies will be built? Uh, and if we're really kind of going for the moonshot generational companies, what are you imagining? I think it's a really important question. And not to be too nerdy, but I do often go on like two by twos. And I think if we put creativity on the y-axis and, and productivity on the x-axis, you've got on the sort of like bottom right quadrant, the, the pure productivity hacks. So that could be things like uh, Supernormal or Otter AI, which are just really helpful things that can make us all more productive, uh, whether it be in the workspace or whether in our personal lives, they're just kind of like useful tools. And on the sort of like top left quadrant, you've got things which are just pure, pure creative delight. And it's the kind of thing that I spend a lot of time on, whether it be like in a DALI or, you know, Stable Diffusion, just building really cool, creativity for creativity's sake. So I think for me, where I'm looking to find like really what I think will be generational defining companies is, is in that like top right quadrant where you've got that blend of like super high creativity and super high productivity. And you definitely do have ones that are kind of in between. So, mm -hmm. so I'm a big fan of Notion. So I think that, you know, that's it's kind of creative, but it's you know, fundamentally product, product, productivity tool. But if we really stick to that top right quadrant, you've got companies that, as I said, are peak creativity and uh, peak uh, productivity. And I think a great example of that is uh, Runway ML. I'm just picking one for an example that we, we talked about, where um, it's you know, helping people, anyone, again, with an imagination can become a you know, movie producer, effectively. It, it's really, really high quality text to, to video and, and film based. Um, um, products. So that for me is the kind of quadrant I'm looking for, but I still, you know, I still love the, the tools in the other, other quadrants as well. Yeah. I've been thinking about the X, Y axis myself a lot, but I've called it like utility and then sort of social creativity. And, yeah. Interesting. Well, actually not even create, like just utility and social because um, it's really interesting when you look at products and if you've really kind of examined yourself in terms of what you use it for. I think a lot of the time we think that we're using it for different things than we actually are using it. And I find that actually very funny and surprising, at least like from a personal perspective. And um, Sayan, what do you think? Um, same question. Well, I think 
Well, I want to talk about why I'm excited about these products, because in a world that seems increasingly more dark by the day, where we have wars, where we have issues that you might even argue we should be thinking more about than this, I would argue the opposite, which is if you look at generational theory and you look at, um, let's just go back to the 60s to look at the Vietnam War, uh, out of that came one of the most amazing creative periods of our time. If you look at the hippie movement, if you look at the rock and roll movement, if you look at the art movement that came out of that, in order to protest, in order to have a voice, in order to speak about the issues that are dark in this world, we have to tap on creativity. And so I think that, it, you know, creativity used to be something that was reserved for the elite, which was, you know, you had to be an artist or you had to have a certain number of hours to master a skill. But now because of AI, we can do all sorts of really amazing things. And I know that's controversial right now. Like, if you create something on mid-journey, is it art? Right. But I would argue that it is, because I think that when you're taking an idea and you're giving it to a co-author like AI, and you're coming out with this amazing image afterwards, um, you're basically a person who never had the time or the ability to master Photoshop or become a film editor yeah. is suddenly able to get these ideas out of their head out onto a canvas for the first time. So I think we're going to see unprecedented creativity. All of the signage that you see around the world is going to change. You know, I, I, I told my partner that the other day. I'm like, look at all the signs around us. They're all going to be different. Because now you don't have to go to a sign shop. You can actually, you know, and yes, we're going to see a disruption in the workplace. We're going to see a whole bunch of industries consolidate, get destroyed, and everything in between. But that happened with the printing press. That happened with Adobe Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yes, it's all scary. But at the same time, you know, I, I'm just so incredibly excited about it. Because for the first time in human history, everyone's going to have a paintbrush and everyone's going to be able to get something outside of their body into the world. And so that's why it's important. You know, I, I think that a lot of people criticize uh, why are we even talking about something like this in this day and age when, you know, stuff's so bad. Yeah. But it's imperative that we create these tools. It's imperative that we invest in them and that people are able to express themselves. Yeah. I really um, think everyone is a wizard now. We've all been given these like magic paintbrushes and said, okay, now go paint. And how cool is that? We all want to be wizards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really unlocking creativity in unprecedented ways. But if we, I guess something that I'm kind of always curious about is that what I was sort of alluding to earlier is that if we're all able to do something now, that doesn't mean that we all will just do it now because there's only a limited 24 hours in the day and we all have to pick our priorities and decide what's personally important and interesting for us. So what do you think are some of the things that, do you think that there's going to be any change in the way that people think about themselves and their skills and what, how they can apply those skills if obtaining those kind of skills becomes easier? Well, sure. Yeah. What, what do you think that will be? I don't know off the top of my head. I'm going to let Pippa go there. No, I was also <laughs> thinking, I'll let Simon start with that. Um, but no, I mean, look, I think that, again, it's, it's enabling anyone that previously, you know, you don't have to have gone to art school, you don't have to have gone to formal training, and, and you can essentially now skip a lot of that and go straight to, you know, this, this core of you know, what do I want to put out? I love that, get, get out of my body and like put into this world. And I think that people are going to use that in different ways. Again, if I use this, this product I was playing around with last week, ID by Ammo, you know, everyone gets a blank canvas and most people have just put on like a few nice pictures and I created my jukebox, I created my, my, uh, my DJ booth, I created my game center. So my reality is very different to someone else's and people will use tools in, in different ways and I think that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Is that all the idiosyncrasies that make us, uh, idiosyncrasies that make us human, I think are going to be splashed out on, on literal canvases uh, all over the world and, and we'll get to enjoy that. Yeah, maybe we can focus more on the ideas. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering how consumerism will change with a lot of this stuff because when you can, one of the things that I really love is a lot of these tools scratch this itch of what if this were possible? What if I could do this? 
And there's never really been anything that really gave everyone that ability to, to scratch that itch. And once you scratch it, you're kind of done. You don't need to go buy the thing necessarily. So like, even on Mid Journey, I can create all these amazing outfits right. and have fun with them. Are they as amazing but, as this one? <laughs> no, this one was off of uh, Instagram. Um, but I, can, I am making outfits off of AI. Actually, I've started getting custom uh, seamstress work where I take an, uh, a picture that I've generated on there. I've started having AI be my stylist. I mean, the whole reason why I have this outfit is because of AI. That's amazing. Which I think is is such a cool point, right? Is that I think we are now, people are so afraid that we're moving into this new generation of like only AI. And I think it's the blend, which is actually what we're seeing. You know, why can't you take something which is, which originated in AI and actually make it IRL and and have it in, in the real threads and have your tailor literally make an AI outfit. I think that's super cool. And I'm also really excited about, I guess, like spatial mapping and some of the kind of AI, a- AR stuff we're, we're seeing through different hardwares where you are seeing this blended, you know, reality now. And, you know, we've just been able to express creativity in multiple formats, which we were never able to do without that technology previously. Yeah. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot of it also in just terms of search and discovery. So I, for example, I'm really into, like, I like to read, sometimes I like to just read one page for a really long time, like I'll just kind of study the page rather than trying to get on with the, with the story of it, because you can find so much within individual sentences, and I'm always like looking for these kind of sentences that communicate the sort of concise idea in pretty simple ways, but that at the same time feels really poetic, and that's something that I can't just put a feeler out in the world and mean like, find me all the cool poetic sentences that sort of tickle my sensibilities, but also communicate a powerful idea in a concise, concise way. But I think we'll be able to do this with, uh, you know, with the help of LLMs to actually just get to the things that make us have these like, great epiphanies and aha moments much faster. And then I hope that if we do that, we're able to build on it ourselves and to actually make something more sort of profound and powerful with the ideas. Um, Cyan, what does serendipity to mean to you in the context of <laughs> in the context of creating online? Uh, kind of continuing with the same thread, uh, thread, and maybe like how does this play out in action in terms of both building and investing? Well, prior to the pandemic, we used to run into each other at work in various places, and you would have this sort of aha moment that would come in the moment where I'd be like, "Ida, oh, there you are! I was just thinking of something, and I thought about you," and but now that's not happening as much because now we're remote and there's these Zoom calls. And when you get on a Zoom call, you're in this weird container of context that you're not supposed to break out of. And so you can't just, you know, have these serendipitous moments where you're running into people and colliding. And so I really would like to see how we solve this uh, with technology because there's not a lot of collisions happening. And that's where businesses in general come up with their best ideas is those spur of the moment things that happen where all of a sudden you have that epiphany and that aha. You know, you're not gonna have that on a Zoom call because we're supposed to talk about an agenda on there and get through it and then get to the next call and the next call and the next call and by the time of that, you're just like, okay, I'm worn out. But, you know, so I do think that the future of creativity online needs to involve tools and entrepreneurs need to think about how are we going to collaborate with one another? How are we going to go down rabbit holes with one another? How are we going to reach for the highest answer, you know, and find it um, in, an, in this world that we're now facing where remote work seems to be the future? I mean, I know some businesses are going back to in-person, but for the most part, I, I think that we're done with that. And so that's one of the things that I'm excited about and looking forward to and hope to see more founders working in that area. Yeah. Enabling the density of serendipity, as a friend of mine said. I think yes, so. yeah. absolutely. Um, Pipa, <laughs> what are you looking for as an investor when uh, investing into the future of creativity online? Like, is there something particular that's constantly sort of at the back of your mind when you're talking to founders and, and making decisions? I think, I think the first thing I'm looking for is consistent, no matter which sector I'm investing in. And if we call this, like, broadly creativity, that could be in a lot of different things, right? I think at the most core, I'm looking for really wild thinkers. So I want people to think of the impossible and tell me the steps that they're going to try and take to get there. Um, And I think, especially investing at the earlier stage, I typically invest at pre-seed and seed, 
That by far is the most important thing. I want to understand how you think and how big you can think. And I'd say, obviously, the second part, if we're going to put the investor hat on, is there is, of course, a part of me which is, wants to know, okay, what is your view and your evolving view on how you can carve out a really meaningful piece of a particular problem that you're trying to solve? And is actually there a, a business model at the end of it which has the ability to kind of scale and be defensible? But I would really caveat that I typically focus on the first one a lot more. And it, you know, if, if someone is giving me both, I will essentially wait a lot more to the first one than I will to the second, because if they're the right founder, they will find the right way to, to get to that outcome. Yeah. The, there's a very intense orange paper <laughs> going on in the screen that I think says our time is up. So thank you guys both. And thank you to the audience for being here and listening us blab about the future of creativity online. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.